how hackable would a digitized city be? I guess the, the more complex you make a network, the more attack surface there is for hackers. So what is that worst case scenario? Government on government hacking cyber warfare. By accident, we have, we have become passive observers of this technology. There's huge potential for abuse, but you have to balance that with the huge potential for good and for benefits. I'm Victoria Turk and this is Motherboard. Today we're talking about digitization and how we're connecting more and more objects around us and using big data on an unprecedented scale. Joining us to share their insight are Anab Jain, designer and co-founder of Superflux and the Internet of Things Academy, Jake Davis, former hacker turned consultant and researcher, and Stephen Hilton, who is Director of Futures at Bristol City Council and who's been leading a citywide digitization project that we'll see more about later. So, the Internet of Things, smart cities, big data, these are all popular buzzwords right now. What are we actually talking about? If you're talking about cities, there's a lot of ideas, ideas around connecting the infrastructure of the city to networks so that you can get real-time information about various kinds of things. There's stuff around measuring uh, traffic, there's stuff around waste disposal, there's sensors that can measure different activities, basically. In the domestic environment, you're talking about connecting. There are connected lamps or, you know, toasters, and, you know, there's all sorts of the whole idea of connected smart forks and mattresses, all of that that's going to supposedly help us better understand what we do in our lives and make it easier and more efficient. Yeah, so what's the point of this kind of digitization? I'm, I'm, I'd say I'm more of, a, more of a Luddite with Internet of kind of things related to uh, toasters, forks, yeah. uh, connecting <laughs> the cats and dogs to the Internet. And I thought that, especially the other week when I heard about uh, an internet-enabled cat water bowl. And there's, there seems to be an element of convenience over security with it as well. Sort of, it's quite an innocuous device, like an internet-enabled toaster. And so when it's built, there's no kind of budget set aside or real thought put into how this thing will be secured. Because that toaster is connected to your phone or your router at home or your laptop, then it becomes part of, it becomes a very insecure sort of device. So. I'm a, I'm a bit sceptical about the household appliance Internet of Things in that sense. <laughs> but obviously there's a lot of promise there too. What's the potential benefits that we can take from this kind of thing? From a city perspective, a lot of smart city sort of talk is about making the city as efficient as possible. But I guess in Bristol we also recognise that it's more than that. How can you create different sorts of cultural experiences using some of these technologies to allow you to sort of interact with the city and with other people in different ways. Obviously, you're involved with some of these ideas on that city scale. Tell us about the Bristol is Open project. What we call, is that? We call it the Open Programmable City. We're trying to create an infrastructure within the city that lots of different people can plug into. Great, so we recently went to Bristol and visited this project, so let's take a look. There is a promise that technology might help us to manage living in cities in a cleverer way. Today, more than half the world's population live in cities, and soon it will be about 70% of the world's population. And in that space where there's now more connectivity than you've ever seen in your life before, we expect a lot of innovation to happen. Why are we meeting here at this lamppost? <laughs> well, all along here, this is called, we call it the Brunel Mile. And this is a mile of uh, waterway, and we've created what we call the wireless mile. And then we have a mesh canopy of connectivity across the whole city on the lampposts. So there are tens of thousands of people who use this area. And we're going to use this for experimental work on wireless communication technology. It's sort of organized chaos. So it is, you know, Bristol is open. It's an infrastructure to bring in very, very, very large amounts of data from the sensors that the wireless mesh will connect up and making citizens part of that ongoing experimentation. Good cities in the future are ones where everybody is part of the experiment about what it means to live within a city. That must also pose some privacy questions yeah. if you're treating your citizens as lab rats. Yeah, well, indeed, a city, a city as a laboratory where the citizens are not treated as guinea pigs is how we describe it. Because <laughs> there is a real risk that this starts to feel like Big Brother and that there is some 
shadowy figure collecting all of this data from people as they walk or drive around Bristol. So what do you do about that? Well, I think what you do about that is you have a really open conversation with people about how they want to engage. So with the Bristol is Open project, uh, which is bringing these kind of huge, super fast networks to the city, how does this control room fit into the future of that? The eyes and ears. It's an integral part of one of many forms of information that either we would like to hold or we hold already from a resident of the, the city. So the early intervention, as well as obviously using that, in, in, that intelligence if we record it, if there's been a criminal act at court. So you're almost trying to stop crime and stop injury before it happens? Yes, this is around public space reassurance, public space intervention to enable issues to hopefully be prevented at the earliest point. The key concept, the key architecture that we are promoting from Bristol is open, an operating system for all smart cities. It's actually going to transform the cities the same way that Android transformed the mobile phone industry. So anybody could program and customize a service for themselves. So it's full opening up, full democratization of a smart city infrastructure. So it's essentially open source? Oh, it is completely open source. Yes, our solution is open source. So the city does whatever the citizen would like it to do. It's not a top-down provision of services. The local authority does not necessarily always know the best what the citizen needs. I think that we are going to be able to provide more human services to the citizens and make the city a happier place. And some of the things that are happening at Bristol, for instance, that are around citizen happiness, that are around playability, is going to provide completely new concepts for future smart cities. So how does all of your work fit in with the Bristol is Open project? Well, Bristol is open is um, brilliant for us because what we obviously a, a, a massively networked city that allows us to have huge potential to make new work in this way um, helps us to open up ideas, but also to support the bigger ideas because we're really looking at Playable City as, is, as it's growing internationally. We want to really sort of start tackling bigger and bigger projects and the more capability that a city has for us to do that is, is great for us. It's obvious that this could be used for so many good things, but at the same time, I think any new technology that's as widespread and as far-reaching as this can appear a little creepy, at least at first. This is going to happen. It's coming. The sooner we can embrace this and get to grips with it all, and all the consequences, positive and, and challenging as well, there are as many answers to what this is about as there are people in the city. What do you think, Jake? Does this hyper-connected future inspire or terrify you? Uh, I think, you know, on paper, it's, it's kind of, it's fascinating. It is inspiring. It must be um, amazing to look at kind of the back end of this and see how it all works. And I was thinking about that wireless mile or the lamppost, etc. There are so many things that could potentially go wrong with that from even uh, accidentally hardware failure, software failures, failure of the sensors to more sort of harmful risks like we looked a little bit at the potential for Big Brother governments, the corporate surveillance and the co collecting that amount of data, you know. Do people want that data in the hands of others or do they even really care? So I think there's an education aspect there. What is the problem if there's a security risk in an internet connected bin? Well, it depends what the internet connected bin is connected to. And so that if there was a unique exploit found in one of the bins and a hacker sat uh, dormant in that bin software for a year waiting for some connectivity fault between that bin and um, uh, the supercomputer it's connected to, and then through kind of leveraging, they could access more parts of the city. I guess the, the more complex you make a network, the more attack surface there is for hackers. Um, they don't kind of go into it thinking, this is a city, it has a million different things, we're going to get them all at once. It would probably start with a bin or something innocuous like that and then branch out slowly. So yeah, I think each individual part of the city needs to be kind of looked at and audited. But that doesn't really happen with things like I don't know, toasters and bins and so security is overlooked where it, it shouldn't be. So what is that worst case scenario? Oh, I guess the worst case scenario would be not individual hackers, but you know, government sponsored hacking if we're, if we're in a sort of war zone situation where a, a government hires, a, hires a, a building full of hackers and then decides to take out everything on the power grid at mm. once. And I guess when you're talking about hacks on that level, it's pretty challenging to defend against that sort of scenario. 
there's a kind of a two-way risk. Yeah. There's a risk of having so many different individual um, manufacturers and parts and auto uh, kind of a autonomous units that it mm. becomes impossible to unify and protect everything at once. And then there's the other end of it, which is it would be absolutely even more terrifying if everything was owned by one entity, well, because yeah, then they have that control, which is slightly uh, as scary as the potential for things going wrong. So there's a balance to be struck, I think. Those risks in mind, what are the benefits here? Could we use this network to design some kind of digitized utopia instead? Um, I think there are a lot of benefits if, we are, if that education part happens first. So I think that's a really good point you made there. Um, and the benefits are that if people start understanding what the potential is, then they'll start using it for actually what the technology is meant to do. Like, can farmers use Internet of Things to understand how to make our ecosystems more sustainable, what kind of crops to grow, where do they grow, what moisture do they need um, for health purposes, you know, where there is more polluted water, where there's radioactivity in water. All of those things are possible. It comes from people and their passion to do something about a concern. And I, I think you've designed a few prototypes already. Yeah, we are doing a project currently called Buggy Air. It's part of IOTA that we've co-founded. And it's, this, is a, this is a very big sensor kit, which contains three sensors, one for measuring carbon monoxide, one for nitrogen dioxide, and one for particulate matter. We're going to attach these to prams and walk around the city. And there is an app which is connected to the website where the data is in real time measured. We're basically giving people a sense of what data they're collecting and then letting them decide what they want to do with the data. So you're trying to kind of enlist individual parents to stick that on the back of their buggy? Yeah. And become a walking pollution sensor? Basically, yes. Because personal exposure to air pollution is very different to what is being currently measured. When does monitoring people's behavior coincide with snooping on citizens? There's, there's huge potential for abuse. I recognise that. Um, but you have to balance that with the huge potential for good and for benefits. Mm -hmm. and, and unless you have a, a sort of sensible conversation with people about what, what the right level is, then we're not going to be able to sort of get to that point of being able to exploit the benefits. Well, worst case scenario, I, had, I, don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot yeah. with this question. What if an agency like the NSA or the GCHQ yeah approached you and said, you've got all this information about um, people walking down these streets in a certain way. We, we want all of it. Where do the ethics lie in, in, in handing that information over from, from the, from the so community maybe, to, to a, a, I mean, uh, what can you be subpoenaed, for example, yeah. into, into fully disclosing lamppost data? I aren't able to comment on the legalities of, of what we could or couldn't be legally enforced to do. But what I would say is that I think what you've described is a really good reason why a city needs a project, a project like Bristol is Open. And I would much rather be in a position where we'd got some sort of policy, some sort of statement, some sort of governance of our own that we could use to say, well, no, we're not, we're not going to do that because this is our policy. Do you think that people actually want this? People are right now, I don't think, by and large, are in a position to decide what they want because they don't know quite what they're getting right now or, or get taking away, being taken away from them. If there is a way that every time my data is being used by X company, I get something in return, financial or otherwise, then I'm sure a lot of people want in. I don't think many people currently even understand what they would be getting with a smart city because it would be kind of a, when people kind of think about that and they see examples of it so far, unlike, unlike Bristol is open, they kind of see it as being a sort of us versus them and all this new kind of smart technology and they're being quite, it being quite mystified and guys are quite abstracted. And so this kind of gives them more of an ingress point into that. If the smart bit is an enabler of all of those other good things that make a city, you know, a city like Bristol a good place to live, then I'm happy. The feedback we get is that people want to be part of that conversation, even if, even if it means that experiments don't always get it right the first time.